Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in. We're just going to give a few more minutes and then we'll kick start uh, it's from here. You see, folks are dialing in from different parts of the world Bangalore, Pretoria. We, we are dialing in from uh, New York, uh, Buffalo, which is uh, in the border of Canada. And my co-host, Zach, is dialing in from- uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hello, Nicholas from Argentina. Thank you for joining in. Uh, from Germany, Lahaji, thank you. Eric yeah, from Sacramento, Dale from Melbourne, thank you. I appreciate you guys staying late in uh, the international time zone. So uh, yeah, uh, and support from Bangalore. So uh, God knows how, what time is there right now, uh, midnight. But thank you for joining in. Isaac, welcome. Thank you for having me, Ravi. I'm excited to get this rolling. Yeah, pretty excited here. Hope uh, our audio is clear for everybody. Uh, if you are facing any difficulties, just type in the comment section uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that our audios are back up and clear. Uh, Dr. Forrester, thank you for joining in from Italy. Awesome, we have people from all over. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mani Kandan. Thanks for joining in. Hi, Glenn. Thanks for joining in. Well, it's at the uh, top of the hour here to kick things off. Um, and what we will do is I'll just uh, uh, housekeeping items here, just some logistical um, items related to uh, this webinar. Uh, first of all, I'm really excited that all of you have been joining from all parts of the world uh, here and uh, uh, as much as you know, we present, we are here to engage uh, with you all from uh, your fantastic questions. So feel free to type as the presentation is in progress. Uh, keep raising your questions as well as uh, uh, any feedback that you have, you know, you can type. We have two moderators uh, um, in these trails team, uh, Kim and John, who will be moderating your questions and will be consolidating and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation here. Uh, so I would encourage you guys to all uh, keep typing your questions, keep floating in here. With, on that note, uh, we will uh, go ahead and uh, kickstart uh, the webinar presentation for today. And the topic is the untapped potential of drone data in drilling and blasting. Uh, to kick things off, I would just like to uh, introduce uh, myself. My name is Ravi Sahu, and I'm the founder and CEO of Estreos, which is a drone data software company where we build a various analytics on top of uh, data that has been collected by drones and other remote sensing systems. My co-host, Zach Tobias, uh, is a technical representative at Marscott, currently is in charge of 3D photogrammetry, bow tracking, and volumetric surveying for modern Scott. Uh, he's located in Pennsylvania, Coopersburg. Uh, he has almost about four years of experience gaining both his Pennsylvania blasting license and part 107 uh, drone license as well. He holds a BS uh, Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Geology uh, from Kurtztown uh, University. Thank you, Ravi. 
Thank you, Jack. I'm really thrilled to have you here, and um, you know, uh, having you know, you sharing your insights, um, you know, for the drilling and blasting industry here. Yes, thank so, you for having me. Awesome. So we have a handful of topics to cover uh, for today's presentation. Uh, here is for today's agenda. Uh, I will go, give an overview of his trails for roughly five minutes. Uh, and then roughly 10 minutes, we will cover uh, why um, you should think about or you should look into uh, considering drones uh, for 3D face profiling. And uh, after you know, drone data, what are the other applications where as you collect the data, you can apply artificial intelligence or machine learning to optimize the blast and each step of uh, the process here. Uh, so that will go collectively and then Next 20 minutes, uh, Zach will uh, share his, in, his insights, how he got started with drones in his organization, as well as what is the value that they are uh, providing to their customers and uh, the different improvements that they are uh, doing uh, in the quarries and mine job site with some real case studies and stories, uh, which is always interesting uh, to hear on. Uh, so that's for today's agenda. So we have uh, a poll here for a short, a uh, um, little bit, you know, 30 seconds poll. Uh, and uh, if you can answer those, we'll leave the poll open. Uh, yes, somebody is asking, you know, yes, the webinar is, is recorded and uh, we'll definitely share with you. So just a bit more about uh, Estreos here. Uh, the company was founded in 2016 uh, and uh, we are a fairly young company, but we are growing uh, fast and we, uh, we seem to think that we are uh, leveraging the data in this industry to bring a lot of uh, improvements and we are uh, partnering on various use cases with these industry players here. And currently the platform is utilized in roughly 450 quarries and mines um, in eight different countries. Uh, and we have global presence um, offices in Asia, uh, Bangalore, and in uh, North America, St. Louis and Buffalo. Uh, that gives us ability to do 24 by 7 customer support. Uh, some of the key metrics that we track as a part of our platform is uh, how many projects, uh, how the value has been realized, roughly 60,000 uh, drone flights has been done. Uh, so these are drone data projects. Um, roughly 12 million imageries uh, has been analyzed, but uh, really the savings, that's uh, what we really look for, how uh, our customers are using this platform to realize savings in their drilling and blasting operations. Uh, so roughly 30% savings uh, and 8% improvement in the fragmentation uh, that platform has uh, been able to produce uh, of, through the data analytics here. Uh, so we consider it as more of a mine to mill um, of, you know, suite of applications where we utilize data to optimize uh, each step of the process. Uh, so starting with the site surveying where you would uh, capture the data and do uh, various types of, you know, georeference model and surveying. Uh, but once you have the model, you can use the same data to uh, apply machine learning to detect various uh, rock mass related features, uh, which is related to understanding of geology, uh, and then applying it to the uh, drilling side, where uh, you can do a GPS precise drill layouts, uh, and then more optimizing your blast planning. Uh, and there are other applications that has been, uh, it's the trend now where you have a smart drills where you can bring the smart drill data and you can see the strata of each information down the hole. Uh, so, so the combination of drones and uh, machines has been proving to be an important uh, key performance indicator for overall blast optimization. And then also after the, your blast or pre-blast, you can see the mock file predictions, uh, as well as after the blast, um, if you are optimizing your road grades or various hall road related uh, uh, issues or the design improvement on the whole road that can be done um, as a part of the suite of application. And uh, after the blast, one of the things everybody is looking is how the blast performed or what's kind of the old, um, 
or uh, sorting or sensing systems that they can develop. So uh, that's a part of application as well, where drone is proving to be a much more uh, easy to use tool where you can get the data in uh, roughly under 10 minutes and you can apply various techniques to get this uh, analysis. And on the reporting side where we can have a full suite of uh, stockpiling and inventory can be done easily through the drones and the data in this case. Uh, so the workflow is very simple. Uh, you fly, you capture some pictures. Uh, I'm going to be talking more in terms of the face profile where you have a top of the bench, uh, where you have a high wall and a floor. Uh, so that roughly, um, in this case, you won't be covering the entire mine site or entire quarry site. Uh, so we're relatively collecting less number of images and uh, typically 60, 70 pictures in an average uh, that we receive, and that can be uh, processed very fairly. Uh, so the workflow is you fly, um, your drone takes some pictures within 15 minutes, you upload that into either in a cloud or either in an offline uh, standalone processing. Then you can design the shot, which is uh, relatively, you are doing a front row burden optimization, which is automated shot layout really understanding where your weak burdens are uh, and then generating a report. Uh, so this is how uh, the face profiling workflow looks like. Uh, but this is where kind of, you know, I would like uh, to ask more uh, uh, or talk about what's the evolution or here is the evolution of the face profiling methods. Uh, when we look into the evolution, uh, we have tape measure and burden pole as one of the conventional methods uh, and that has been utilized for several years and they still uh, it's been utilized. This is uh, as it's um, in a traditional form where you have uh, requires a crew uh, to operate this uh, you know, measurements. Uh, uh, the problem or rather I would share, uh, say as um, the data point is limited you have uh, in the burden pole it's most of the time you have difficult uh, to understand uh, relatively where the weak burdens are sometimes. In this case, as you can see, there is an undercut there, which is sometimes hard to measure just uh, utilizing burden pole where, uh, uh, so it requires high degree of, again, uh, experience if your burden pole is not relatively stable. Uh, and then the next step uh, is the 2D profiles and laser scans as well, where uh, you're relying on, again, a high degree of technical skills to, uh, to operate these uh, equipments. And what we see is sometimes the setup error can happen if, uh, uh, if it's not positioned relatively uh, very correctly uh, relative to the face. Uh, and sometimes also errors can happen if not, uh, you know, held up vertically um, on the, uh, your pole as well. One of the things that I always uh, bring out is uh, to, in the case of laser uh, scans, the 2D burden can be relatively large or can be relatively small if uh, the angle of the target pole is not uh, hold up properly. Uh, so that's what it is showing in the bottom of the picture, you know, how you hold that has a bigger uh, impact on the precision of the laser scans. And then now the evolution is moving towards uh, the drones here, uh, right? You know, how do we incorporate drones in the face profiling? Uh, and we see that a lot of the uh, workflow and uh, automation can be realized by incorporating drones in the 3D uh, face profile. And that's what I would like to uh, discuss more here uh, in this part of the presentation. So this is one of the uh, analogy that uh, I, I heard somewhere and I, uh, I stole it. Uh, uh, so, which is basically kind of, if data is the new oil, then drones are the new drill rig, uh, right? And how you can leverage the power of data that you're gathering from drones on a daily basis or two times, um, however your frequency is, you can utilize the same data uh, and generate various levels of analytics. Uh, so that's the part of uh, uh, the applications we think that would be creating a significant value for the uh, drilling and blasting operations. So leveraging data and building AI tools on top of it can optimize each step of drilling and blasting and can have a feedback loop into your performance of the blast. So now you can optimize 
what type of fragmentation you are looking to uh, generate or what type of mock pile or the diggability KPIs that you are trying to improve, all that can be packaged uh, into a data form and generate those KPIs you know, for you. So there's another poll coming up uh, for, for you guys to answer if you can take 30 seconds uh, uh, here. And as you're answering, uh, I would continue the uh, presentation. I, I still see folks are joining in. So again, um, thank you for the excitement. Keep uh, posting your questions if you have uh, your questions ready. So when we think about, uh, uh, talk about the drones here, um, so it's just, uh, it's a part of the data gathering. Once you gather the data, it's, you can leverage the same data to de uh, define or generate various levels of analytics. In this case, it's uh, AI, once you've captured the data, which is automatically detecting the geotechnical features. Uh, but why is it important for drilling and blasting? Um, the geotechnical features are usually reserved for uh, doing more complex uh, bench analysis or slow failure analysis. But this is the power of the data that if you have gathered once, you can apply it. And AI, which is doing the job in the uh, background and giving you the result about uh, the positional information of discontinuities or the bedding plane issues of your bench, uh, because you are not uh, producing or you're not manually looking for this information. The AI is combining this information and presenting it to you. Uh, this information can be highly useful if you have not started drilling, but you want to understand at a six feet interval or let's say 10 meter interval, if there is a bedding plane going on, how would I adjust my penetration rate for that bedding plane based on the deep angle and deep direction? That's a fantastic piece of information uh, that you originally in the, uh, you would require a lot of uh, geotechnical analysis to do. But now if we do it more often, that becomes a part of the process. And uh, I see somebody saying lost the audio, but if we see more um, here, then we will continue. But drones are the perfect tool for drill and blast operations here, uh, where we see uh, you can design your front row burdens and it will uh, adjust based on your crest uh, and toe information. Uh, so you can design and optimize the blast based on that. Um, and you can understand where your critical 3D minimum burdens are as well. So it's a perfect tool to meet your production and the environmental uh, constraints that you may have. Uh, or any structural issues uh, that you are realizing. So it can uh, simulate different scenarios of the blast and can optimize uh, the outcome based on that. Uh, this is another way of looking into things where you have uh, uh, caller deviation that you would like to understand where, uh, at what interval, uh, uh, what's my margin of error is, you know, after the drilling has happened, uh, a lot of the times, uh, all these things can be avoided uh, or the more data you can gather, the more information you have uh, to optimize the outcome. So this is another uh, artificial intelligence tool where uh, it's detecting your pre-drill uh, shot design and the post-drill actual drill data point and generating this uh, uh, caller deviation report, uh, which means uh, now you have a very good understanding how far we deviated and how much my pattern was accurate in this case. Another thing from the compliance perspective where AI automatically detects is uh, the high wall issues, whether you are compliant or not, where my crest and toes are, uh, and uh, at the same time, whether I'm uh, from the regulatory perspective, am I meeting all the uh, high wall and bench criteria or not? Another piece of information that we see usually uh, AI is uh, a tool where it's just a tool or it's just the data analytics, but now you can put up to use to your own use case. Uh, in this case, where you can uh, pass on several parameters um, to the AI and say, hey, I want my timing uh, to be in this range, as well as my rock density and rock properties are this for that specific mining. Um, if you are a copper mine or if it's a limestone, you would change that and try to understand the mock pile prediction uh, and 
based on your specific operations, if you are a front loader running operation, or if you are a shovel uh, operation, operations, uh, or if you are a drag line, you would want your mock pile to be in a, that specific you know, equipment you know, performance uh, shape here. So this gives you an understanding how would I can optimize my post blast KPIs as well, how we can improve my digability uh, on these cases. But also you can measure the actuals after the blast has happened, uh, where my central displacements are. So it's automatically comes to all this information as you link this uh, pre-blast to the post-blast and it generates all this information you know, for you. Uh, another way of uh, looking at um, fragmentation is one of the big piece that everybody uh, looks for after the post-blast. Uh, and by combining everything together, you can easily see where my particle size distribution is. Um, if I am uh, really looking to optimize my cost per tonnage or uh, at the crusher level, the different ways of improving my uh, energy or the cost savings there, uh, this is a good metrics to track for. Uh, again, drones are proving to be a very important uh, tool here where you can, as soon as the dust settles after the blast, you can toss the drone back up in the air, 10 minutes, capture 50 pictures, uh, run through the system. Uh, in 30 minutes, you have fragmentation results. Uh, again, I think the huge, I think it's a huge value, huge uh, benefits uh, in, in this case, how uh, the performance can be optimized. One of the things that uh, it's, it's a new uh, topic and it's a very uh, exploratory topic everybody is interested in is the smart drills uh, and how you can leverage that to automate the shot layout um, with by combining uh, drones. The models are already geo-referenced. Uh, and in this case, once your models are geo-referenced, you can also uh, apply the ground control point. And if your G uh, machines, smart drills are GPS uh, enabled, you can directly pass on those uh, uh, drill layout and uh, there you have it you can automate that entire process uh, and once you the drill machines have done drilling you can bring the data back and see where the deviations has happened and for what reasons but more importantly as a blaster it gives me a, a really good piece of information if i can quantify based on the measure while drilling information the true actual logs that much how the machine behave i can now know exactly at uh, 10 feet of interval or you know, uh, five meter interval, uh, this is my 3D minimum burden, as well as what's the penetration rate for that specific interval. So I now I can make truly informed decision about my density, uh, explosive density and the loading parameter that needs to be optimized as well, which you can see side by side uh, uh, now. So this, this is where we see uh, the industry is moving towards as well. Uh, on that note, uh, I'll take a pause here and we have another poll coming up. Please take a time to uh, uh, answer uh, if you can engage uh, in answering the poll. And uh, uh, I will let my co-host uh, uh, share uh, his side of the story and presentation here. Uh, Zach, over to you. Hey, thank you, Ravi, very much. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this seminar we have going on. For those of you who may have tuned in late, uh, my name is Zach Tobias, and I am one of the technical representatives at Mauer and Scott. Um, briefly in the presentation, I'm going to just discuss how we teamed up with Straos and how we use it into our daily, um, our daily workflow. So a little bit about the company, uh, Mauer and Scott, we mainly service the Northeast region of the United States, providing both blasting services and explosives. Um, those states include New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Um, I am certified in Pennsylvania to blast, but my main area of focus uh, is primarily in doing any sort of technical services, such as um, doing mine planning, mine maps, uh, volumetric surveys with stockpiles, and of course, the drilling and blasting side with doing 3D photogrammetry. So a little brief history about Straos and Mauer and Scott. Uh, we first became partners with them back in 2017. Um, at the time, we were using a terrestrial-based system. So just like you're using your 2D lasers, you have to generally be below and perpendicular to the bench that you want to shoot at. Um, and we wanted, and that obviously has its limitations. So by upgrading to an aerial-based system, other than weather, there really is no 
um, uh, implications that you know can mess up profiling data. Um, with that being said, Strayos came along and their aerial-based software was cloud-based as well, which is way different from our predecessor software that we had, where it was a we needed a mobile workstation in order to process and you know uh, spit out a 3D model. Because of the mobile workstation, uh, in, to in order to converse with other blasters or share data amongst the company, I pretty much would have to take my specific laptop with all the work on it and find time to meet up with each individual blaster for each shot in order to go through the data. With a cloud-based software, you can have multiple users, multiple accounts, and everyone just has, there's a Mauer and Scott domain, and from that, everyone can upload into that domain in order to kind of share, um, have accessibility to each of the models and to communicate on pros and cons of models or how they loaded or what this face looks like. Now, when we were starting looking for a new system, all we were really looking for was a 3D photogrammetry software. And what we ended up with was way more than that. Um, there's, I'll be going through some of the things that Mauer and Scott uses, but there's a lot more to Strayos. And that's why we love working with them. I mean, going from 3D photogrammetry to now being able to do my stockpiles, fragmentation AIs, you can do overburden reports. There's a plethora of different things that we can utilize, which just makes Strayos that much sweeter. Uh, lastly, their customer service. Um, I've dealt with Ravi now and his team for a little over three years. Um, they're very responsive. They're easy to get a hold of. And if you have any questions or there's a bug or something that needs to get fixed, they're more than willing to help you out uh, to resolving that said issue. For those of you that do not use drones at all, um, maybe you don't know where to begin. So even before the software, maybe you need to know, hey, what tools do I need in order to you know, do the best job I can? When Mauer and Scott first started um, doing aerial surveying, we bought a DJI Inspire, which is located on the left-hand picture. Now, this drone was great for the time being, but it's rather expensive and it's extremely bulky. Um, the issue with that is with carrying all sorts of other equipment or blasting gear and whatever else you have in your vehicle from going to one site to the next, the bulkiness of this drone was not ideal. So now, uh, the rest of the company we've invested in, I believe we have a total of six, maybe seven uh, DJI Mavic Pro drones. Now these drones have been extremely helpful. They're very cost effective. You can get you know, a whole bundle pack for a, a reasonable price. Um, they do exactly what you need um, in terms of profiling and all the fun stuff. The camera's great on it, as well as they, this specific drone, the blades and the wings collapse into each other to make it a very small form fitting drone. Uh, easy to store and carry around with you to whatever site you need to go to. Now heading more towards the drilling and blasting side, um, how Mauer and Scott has worked with Strauss into doing our 2Ds. Um, in terms for layouts, working with the blasters and working with the drillers, the Ravi went into a little more detail with laying out, but it's a very quick and easy process that provides very precise results. Um, I've done my fair share of training other coworkers and multiple blasters on how to utilize this program to its fullest um, in essences where they can't utilize things such as their burden pole or um, using a 2D laser. And they're on board and now I have a, a blaster that shoots a quarry where they crush about four and a half million tons um, of rock a year. And he 2D profiles or he, he does a 3D photogrammetry with the drone on every single one of his shots. He's able to keep up with production and profile these faces faster than he would be able to if he was using his old method of the 2D laser, setting up cones on the top, driving down below, and having to go back up and down in order to lay out a shot. Um, when a blaster does design his shot and lays out all of the holes, so we'll just say, for instance, a blaster lays out a two-row shot. It's a small shot. From that, the blaster can calculate his um, you know, 2D burdens off of the face, as well as export a drill plan. Now, the great thing about the drill plan is every hole that you Im, uh, import or put into the Strayos model gets geotagged. So if at any point in the future you want to come back and know where these holes were for whatever reason, you have a GPS tagged hole 
um, for your entire shot, uh, which is especially helpful in the instance if you have holes in the center of you know of a big shot that you couldn't load or they were short well you may end up with a toe at the end of that shot which is valuable information to then reciprocate to a loader operator to tell them hey you know maybe 20 feet in there's going to be a, a real nasty toe be careful when you're digging there i've seen <laughs> loader operators when they do hit that and it's not a fun time at all for them uh, from that drill plan as well you it does give the inclination of the hole it gives you a, a delta of difference in height and when you establish what your floor or what the bench below is it will give the driller the depth for each specific hole so instead of having a driller or a excuse me a blaster write a you know a sloppy report you can have a nice clear and concise report that you can give to the driller and he can legibly understand exactly what you want and where he wants these holes um, with that being said the the uh I mentioned before about the cloud base and the accessibility with the cloud based software. Um, if I'm in another state, let's just say I'm in New York and a blaster is in a completely different part of the, the country, we can still communicate on specific models because we're not, again, localized to the hardware or it's not localized to our specific laptop or desktop, which is great because there's been instances where I'm in another area and the blaster and my coworkers in another area, but we can still communicate and discuss and both at the uh, same time look over a model and see kind of what strategies or what we want to do for said uh, specific bench or face that we're um, going to blast off of. I did mention with the drill plan export, it gives you a GPS tagged uh, hole location. To further that precision, you can use a standalone GPS and import those um, also known as GCP ground control points into these models to gain in either another layer of accuracy, uh, which I've done many times. It's very easy to do. Um, you just have to make sure you have your targets set up big enough that the Strayos can identify where these markers are that you have placed down. Um, not to go too deep into all the things Strayos has to offer, but some of the big ones that I've used personally, um, a newer tool maybe in the past year that Strayos has implemented is their burden optimization tool. Now this tool has really changed how quickly I can establish a layout and design a shot. In the past, when you Strayos asks for your parameters of your spacing, what your your toe is, where your floor is, and all these other parameters. Um, and from that, it will ask you, it it's very it takes some time to get used to, to how to how to use the program. But once you do, you have to move a hole accordingly, one second, um, one by one. With the burden optimization tool, you put in a set of parameters such as what your optimal burden is that you wanna shoot, your minimum burden, uh, neglection of stemming, just meaning that if you set your neglection of stemming to 10 feet, um, Strayos isn't gonna try to fit your optimum burden into that threshold because you're not gonna be loading it anyways. And the last um, parameter that you would need to put in is the maximum inclination. So you can tell Strayos, hey, I don't want this hole to be designed any greater than a 15 degree or 20 degree. And from that, Strayos will adapt its bearing or its you know, compass direction and the inclination and the distance it is uh, to the crest or away from the crest to establish a burden that you're comfortable with or that you have previously designated it as. Um, again, from that, with the burden optimization tool and by putting in a whole shot layout, you can also do a blast volume estimation. Very easy. I know I'm sure blasters that are in here know how to do a blast volume estimation to calculate the tonnage they're getting off of a shot. Uh, Strayos makes it even easier because you don't have to do any freehand work on the side. Your holes are already put in, your burden's already calculated. And from that, it does the math for you and it will spit out uh, a very good representation of, hey, I should get X amount of tons from this shot that I'm about to shoot. Uh, last but not least, Robbie did discuss it more in detail, but the muck pile prediction tool, it's a really interesting tool to see the parameters you put in for the given bench or rock that you're shooting out of a specific quarry, such as the density, the tensile strength of the rock, um, you know, your, your powder factor and some other parameters that it may ask for you can see a shape of how this 
rock will move and how it ends up as a muck pile. You can further that into after the shot is um, goes off, you can refly the muck pile and use an AI comparison tool to see how close it was from the the you know pre-blast, the prediction, to the post-blast to see exactly um, how it came out. I've used the tool and it works really great. And it's very impressive to see how accurate it is. Um, so I was looking down at the polls and I did see that a fair amount of you use drones. Um, I see uh, some of you guys are using laser scanners, 2D profiles and burden poles. Um, in an instance uh, that we have here um, with the drone, you don't have to worry about any sort of equipment or any quarry operations getting in the way of doing your job as a blaster or a technical representative, whether you're using um, a 2D laser, an auto scanning laser, um, or using a terrestrial 3D system. Now in this specific, specific quarry, uh, they only have one face to shoot off of. So what we ended up doing was we would blast, they would bring an excavator up on top of the muck pile and then go down and scrape out a trough in front of the face. So then we could come in and profile. Now, if you if your tool was a 2D laser, an auto scanning laser, well, you really can't be climbing that that muck pile. So you'll have to wait until the muck pile is completely cleaned up. In the sense of the drone, I can stay up on this bench up above, fly and get a very good profile of the drone without having any sorts of air included in my face. Ravi did mention the issues with the burden pole, where if there's a, a sharp edge or there's cutbacks in that face you're not going to know those are there using a burden pole. It's very unlikely you will. And by the time you get that shot drilled or you get it laid out and the shot is drilled, you know, it could be too late. If you still don't know exactly what you have, that could be a big whoopsies. Now with the drone, you're going to get exactly what the face shows and there's not going to be any hidden surprise of um, any sort of razor back or cavity in the face that the drone's not going to pick up. And by doing that, you are reducing your error for any sort of mistakes. Um, by being able to fly over top of muck piles, we've been able to keep production up um, tenfold at this specific uh, specific quarry where we don't have to wait for the loader operators to move all this material out and crush it. We can just have this shot prepared and ready. So when this muck pile is finally cleaned up, this shot is already drilled. Uh, it's already been profiled. I will come back on a later date and bore track all the face holes and implement that data into my, my 3D model. And from that, we can instill confidence into the blaster knowing that there's no, um, you know, no real mishaps that could possibly happen. And we know that the face is exactly what I said it is with also the bore track data um, adapting to any hole deviation or any over drilling or under drilling. Uh, lastly, there, the great thing, again, going back to the cloud-based system, I know I keep harping on that, but it has proved to be extremely advantageous versus having like a mobile workstation or everything localized to a laptop. Um, with Strauss, you can model, model multiple benches or you can do multiple profiles at once. Um, I've done at a single quarry, if I have multiple benches that are ready, I can go through, set up those benches um, to be profiled. And as long as there's no material in front or the quarry operators have set the face ready for me. I can go up, fly all those, um, have my sets of photos for each particular bench and upload those, um, all those photos to Strauss's cloud-based system. And they will both process at the same time once they're done uploading. Whereas in the past, if I had multiple models, I'd have to wait for one model to finish, then go on to the next one, then go on to the next one, which just reduces my effectiveness of being out in the field and my productivity. So here's an issue that was very, um, that was prevented by having the capabilities of utilizing Strauss with Ortrack data and having the drone. So this was a quarry located in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know the full story, but more or less the blaster couldn't get below to properly uh, 2D profile with his laser, the face. And I believe the face slipped off after he had laid out the shot. Now, incorporating with bore track data, um, I was asked to come down, bore track the face, and implement the pretty much my 3D profile of the face with that bore track data. And I hope you guys can see this on the left. 
I have the threshold set to 12 feet. So anything less than 12 feet of burden will show up in red. Uh, if you can't read it, more or less, all of this blaster's burden were well below five feet, eight feet. And I believe he normally is looking for anywhere from maybe 14 to 16 feet of burden on the entire face. Now this was one hole and out of the 25 total facials, about 20 of them were this bad. Um, <laughs> the amount of powder that is coming out of that face uh, at that rate would be terrifying as well as the, the plant operations were about uh, two or three benches below. So this shot could have ejected rock way out of the quarry and damaged a lot of quarry equipment in the process. Uh, but by being able to utilize the drone and bore track data collectively, we you know pretty much prevented a huge disaster. Another area I have now, as you can see, this face doesn't look too great either. Um, this was located in Hamburg, New Jersey. There's multiple razorbacks or cutbacks in this face um, that posed a problem for how the blaster wanted to go about loading the shot and what he wanted to do with it. Um, the biggest issue too was there was a an overflow lot for a used car dealership located about less than 500 feet from where this shot was facing. So if there was any fly rock or any issues, the last thing we wanted is any of that rock to A, leave the pit, or B, to even make it close to where that um, car lot was. So the blaster had called me and asked if I could help him out with this layout. Now, he wanted to be as precise as possible. When you model with uh, using strails with the 3D photogrammetry, it will pick up every crack and crevice like you can see here. I know, you know, with a, with a burden pole, you may miss a lot of that. And with a 2D laser, maybe you could hit, at, hit all of these points, but the drone will take care of that work for you. So why make more effort on yourself when you have the new technology that's coming out that's making your life more efficient, uh, you're being more productive, and you're reducing any sort of error risk that could happen on your behalf. Um, I wasn't there to see this shot, but this shot did come out fine. A lot of oversize. The blaster ended up decking through all of these lighter spots, and then they just hammered all the oversize. So on to this. So this instance we have here, now this was a quarry based in New Jersey. This was the quarry I mentioned earlier. They crush about four and a half million tons uh, yearly. And the blaster that's in charge of shooting that pit strictly uses his drone to do all of his layouts. Um, and he's had been having great success with it. I trained him and he's he really enjoys it because it saves him a lot of time and frees him up to do other things. Um, in the instance of this shot, if you look on the bottom right hand side of the photo, there's a, a dark shadow. That is actually the conveyor belt that got modeled out, but the conveyor belt at the base is probably about 100 feet away. The very top of the conveyor belt was almost so close to the bench of this shot, it looked like you could touch it. Um, so we wanted to be extra careful that no rock went made it over in that direction. There was no surprises on the face over there. The blaster did end up pulling the shot um, to the adjacent side, so there was no issue. But being able to profile this face, which otherwise we wouldn't be able to do with our old system, the drone gave us the flexibility, um, even though there was no direct path to, to a, a, a terrestrial 3D model, the drone gave us that capability to be able to model it, and we were able to get through this model um, completely safely. Uh, I hope this video, I don't think is gonna load, but a little bit about this place. Uh, this was supposed to be a video. The shot is on the bottom right-hand side and it's facing that loader you see at the top left. The loader was broken down and they could not fix it in time or move it in time. So what they ended up doing was they put a little berm of material in front. I came down the day of the shot and I made sure I bore tracked all the face holes and we 3D profiled all of the shot to make sure that we had no rock at whatsoever that gets close to this, um, this loader. After the shot went off, um, I wish I could play the video so you could see, but the shot came nowhere close. It didn't even get close to the little berm or muck pile that's in front of the loader operator. Uh, but again, it was a good testament to showing how accurate and how great the, uh, the drone can be to making sure everything moves as safely as possible. Um, lastly, just to recap on a couple of things I talked about, 
Um, the design parameters and how you lay out shots in Strayos is very easy. Even if you have people that are maybe not that technologically sound, it's still easy enough to pick up and it works very effectively. So there's really nothing to worry about in that sense. Again, going about going back to the cloud-based system, um, I can share my data with my other coworkers who have accounts to Strayos and we can all kind of be intertwined and make sure we all know what's going on. Or if we have questions, it's very easy to get help um, as compared to having you know a, a mobile workstation where you have to take all your data with you. Again, precise results, that definitely inspires confidence. If you have really jacked up faces and you're utilizing things such as a burden pole and you may not be able to get every single one of those cracks in the face, you can rest assured that by using the drone, Strayos will make sure it models that and it will give you the most accurate representation of the face. Um, with that being said, uh, Strayos helps make you efficient, keeps pr uh, productivity up, and pretty much just overall makes the workflow much smoother. And with that being said, it's a win-win situation. If, you're, if your boss is happy or your own company, Mount Scott's happy with using Strayos and the productivity we've been able to kind of push forward, and it makes our customers happy too, because we can do things that otherwise we would not be able to do. And so it, overall, it's a win-win. And I believe that is the end. So yeah. Robbie, I'll take it back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Zach, for uh, uh, sharing all these stories and the case studies. It's, uh, it's amazing to see that uh, uh, what, what the value is and what the benefit is. I think this, this is... Uh, these stories are inspiring not um, not only for the industry but for me personally that uh, what how much uh, value can be created and it helps us in you know continue to keep uh, uh, building the platform here. Uh, we have uh, several questions from the audience. I would like to kind of you know uh, answer those or at least answer some of those. We have a lot of them. Um, uh, so. But before we uh, kickstart audience question, I do have one question for you, Zach. Uh, I think the implementation of the drone program or any any type of new technology requires mindset change. And uh, yeah. it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, change that brings in. Uh, I'm curious, what is your approach in training uh, your staff uh, to implement the programs uh, like this or successfully implementing program which you Thing you have already done, uh, and what is your recommendation for the folks in the audience who have answered maybe in a poll that they're either using um, the other methods and how they can get started? So we'd love to hear your insights on that. Yeah, um, so it's one of those things. A lot of these blasters that I deal with have been in the industry for thirty years, and you know they're using elect. They're used to using electric caps, you know, and such. So trying to implement some of this new technology may be a little difficult for them because they have their tools that they've been using for years. Um, and they're like, well, this works great. Why should I utilize the drone? Well, the drone provides a lot of extra useful information that where instead of them having to guess, uh, this looks good, they can get precise, real, you know, live face data. Um, as far as training goes, how I've been training a lot of the blasters and some of the coworkers I end up starting with a an outdoors exercise, which is honestly just learning how to profile a face and learning why we're doing what we're doing. And then once we collect the necessary data we need, we I take it into the office. So usually I'm training maybe five or six blasters at a time um, who want to learn. Not everyone wants to learn, but it's useful to learn. So you know that type of um, calculations are out there. And again, if there's any issue, they can call me and be like, hey, can you help me with this. Um, but we do some indoor office training and I go through from start to finish the upload process for Strayos and then, okay, well, here's the model we have and how we're going to, you know, step by step go through to set up my shot, my spacing, the burdens I need and how I, I do all that stuff. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much again for uh, all the insights and uh, um, the presentations uh, and the stories that you have shared. Uh, we have a question from the audience here. I think uh, we'll take uh, a few of them. And obviously, if there are, if we, ran, if we ran out of time, we'll definitely reach out uh, with the specific answers. Uh, 
We have about uh, you know 12 minutes left, so we will answer as much as we can. Uh, the first question is from Lucas. Uh, uh, the question is, does the software consider explosive type uh, and output uh, energy factor uh, in the placement of holes along the crest or just uh, the geometry? Uh, so uh, the, currently the software is designed uh, to take all the parameters from the geometrical perspective. Um, you can optimize your front row burden along the crest, but you can also, you can, if you would want to optimize for the entire shot uh, and the geometry, you can do that as well. Uh, we don't right now uh, uh, recommend the explosive type uh, in the platform, but we, uh, we can incorporate several different types of databases of explosives if that is uh, required. Uh, the second question uh, from Eric, uh, AI color deviation calculation, uh, is that solution uh, developed by Estreos or you use uh, uh, Epiroc drill rig deviation calculation? Uh, I think uh, I may not have understood the question here, but I think the simple answer is the solution, um, the color deviation methods has been uh, uh, developed uh, in-house. And uh, another question uh, here, I'll, I'll probably um, need uh, here, uh, uh, Zach's, you know, would be the good one to answer here is, uh, from the bow track perspective, you mentioned uh, um, you have done bow tracking considerable amount, uh, how, uh, there's a question here mostly from the bow track side, uh, let me read it. Uh, what GPS hole placement equipment do you use? And also what bow tracking equipment do you recommend uh, that is compatible with these trails? Yeah, so currently I in the company, we have two sets of rotted, um, before it was Carlson, it was Renishaw um, systems, but we have two rotted Carlson bore track units, and we also have two cable Carlson uh, bore track units. The uh, implementation to put that data into Strayos is very easy. Um, it, it's it's only a couple clicks. Uh, I saw I did see one person mention that they were having issues. Um, I mean, I'm sure we can discuss that. But uh, the implementation to put the board track data in is very easy. It's a couple clicks. You just have to. It could be the how you're exporting the file type. Um, Rena Shaw and Carlson both have their own sort of board track. Um, data downloader and which from there you have to export as a certain file type in order for Strayos to be able to read that. And then what was the, you talked about GPS, Robbie? Yeah, what GPS hole placement equipment uh, do you use uh, for shot layouts or for just the uh, uh, ground control points? So for GCP, I believe we use a, um, a Trimble, uh, we use a Trimble system, it has a base station and then from there, it has the Rover uh, GPS unit that we walk around with. Uh, it's a carbon fiber uh, stick, and we it references off the base station. And we work our way around measuring GCP. I don't know the exact product um, number. I want to say it's a Trimble R8, and I forget what the, the GPS dome uh, units are. Great. Uh, we have some questions. Um more uh, related to the uh, measure while drilling. Uh, after reading uh, the MWD data in the software, what practical treatment applied to the blasting uh, does the software give to improve the operation? Uh, for example, selective charging, fragmentation prediction. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, so especially the question is what OEMs have in their M measure while drilling uh, data. So the way measure while drilling uh, information is a structure, it's, it's a bunch of uh, information that machine is generating as, you know, down the hole. And it is a very valuable piece of information if, uh, uh, if the operation operators want to start utilizing and it's a highly important piece of information for the blasters, uh, if they can integrate with their loading. Uh, and the way uh, the software is structured is it makes it, it makes it seamless or make it streamlines the process of the data that is being gathered by the uh, machines, which is in the form of IDDs, which is another rock exchange format uh, data. 
uh, it comes in a form of XML or maybe CSV, but uh, XML is much more uh, highly rich in terms of different type of parameters that you can read. So we make it uh, this we make it easy to take that da data, uh, quantify and layer the strata down the hole uh, where the penetration rate was hard, uh, where uh, if there is a void there. So directly reading from the machine. And as you do it more few more times, you can start to know different types of uh, geological properties or the mineral properties, uh, and that you can pass it on to the blaster, which they can uh, load side by side what explicit parameters that they need to adjust uh, here. Uh, so those are the improvements that can be realized, and that is a direct benefit on the fragmentation uh, itself. And uh, really great questions here. Uh, another question is related to the smart drills uh, from uh, James. Uh, can this be exported and thrown on a local coordinate system or published only? Uh, so the smart drill, the way the smart drill uh, data points are set up is uh, uh, it's both um, state plane coordinate systems or directly the local coordinates, which uh, majority of the cases all uh, this uh, drill machines are in the local coordinate, so we do export uh, into the local coordinate, uh, and they can import in the local coordinate as well. Uh, another question that is uh, more related to the uh, processing here is, uh, do we have our own solution for drone picture processing, or uh, how is it efficient than MetaShape? Uh, I mean, time needed for processing and what's the model accuracy? Uh, so this is kind of the accuracy questions. There are several scientific studies that has been done by different universities uh, where they compare different photogrammetry softwares, uh, Strails, uh, some other you know system, uh, some other photogrammetry systems which are out there in the industry. And uh, there are accuracy reports that's been done. So we'd be happy to share that with you uh, on that. Uh, and a few more questions here is, uh, a cloud-based solution sounds great. However, many mining and mining related operations occur in remote and harsh drains with little or no access to farm or network connection. Uh, perhaps a hybrid of offline cloud solution can help to solve this challenge. Uh, I'll probably let Zach answer, take this up uh, since you kind of dealing Mm -hmm. in actual field uh, scenarios, so. Oh. Yeah, so I was reading that question. Um, to respond to that, uh, Strayos does offer an offline standalone program that you can run on your computer. Now, keep in mind, though, uh, it, in areas where there's little to no internet connection. But again, keep in mind, by doing that, I believe, Ravi, correct me if I'm wrong, you will be using the hardware localized on your device, and you're not going to be relying on Strayos's um, server or supercomputer in order to process that data. So if you know moving forward that you're not going to have any internet capabilities, then you should bring a computer that's suitable in order to do 3D modeling. Um, you know, if you have a, one of those slim or thin notebooks, I highly doubt it's going to have the processing power in order to do these models. So make sure you're, you know, cautious of that before going into the field. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we, we do have a hybrid model where offline and cloud can work together as well. Uh, so definitely. Uh, another question that uh, uh, we have here is how AI can help in predicting fly rock position, both in pre and post uh, blast. Uh, so I think the way uh, um, I, I think the AI uh, is empowering with you with a better decision or, or better data points uh, instead of saying better decision. Uh, and at the end of the day, the blaster on the site or uh, an engineer on the site, they are the one uh, who are well experienced. Uh, but AI gives you like more simulated, lot of modeling, lot of more detailed data point that you can utilize and run through several simulations to understand different let's say fly rock situations uh, that you can uh, simulate in several different parameters. Uh, so now as an engineer, I have a better data point, I have a better information that I can act on, uh, 
but at the at the end of the day, I think it's not replacing uh, the actual decision making perspective, which is, uh, anyways, uh, the engineers are doing uh, on the site. Uh, another question from Brandon here is, how does photogrammetry data compare with uh, lidar uh, data? Uh, I think lidar is a great tool. Uh, it's uh, uh, it gives uh, amazing data points, and I think in certain cases, there are, again, studies has been done where photogrammetry has been compared with LIDAR. Uh, it's very comparable, but LIDAR always goes uh, beyond in enriching the data points, uh, but it, it comes with a high cost. Uh, uh, that's where I think the applications of day-to-day -day face profiling um, photogrammetry kind of is, is a better suited, and it has that uh, accuracy that uh, required. Uh, we're almost uh, two minutes mark. I'll just take one last question here. Uh, uh, how many hours uh, does the uh, app take to create Hall Road and the blasting analytical uh, reports here? Uh, so uh, the answer is uh, as soon as you upload the pictures, the Hall Road analysis, if you are looking, uh, it's all, again, machine learning with automatically detecting various geometries uh, and giving you the report. So it depends upon uh, the pictures. If you have 1,000 pictures, uh, the processing time, that's what it is taking longer. Um, and um, your analysis is built in. It's uh, embedded in that once the processing is done, you're getting those results. Uh, same thing on the blasting side. It's uh, again the processing time depends upon the number of pictures. Uh, but usually we, we have seen 60, 70 pictures. You you would be in the range of you know 30, 40 minutes of you know processing time that you are looking here. Uh, with that, uh, I would uh, thank you uh, uh, to Zach and everybody in the audience. We are very grateful that you uh, gave us this time. Um, I really appreciate folks joining in from different parts of the uh, world uh, in different uh, strange, uh, you know, timing uh, time zones here. Uh, would like to wrap up the session uh, again by uh, thanking everybody here. And uh, with that uh, note, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll be sharing the recording, but please, uh, if you have any more questions, reach out to us. This is our email ID. You can reach out to me and Zach as well if you have any specific blasting question uh, there as well. Uh, again, thank you. Stay safe and have a good rest of the day. Yes, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you.